Good evening, everyone. My name is Jens Hoffmann, and I'm Deputy Director for Exhibitions and Public Programs here at the Jewish Museum. And uh, I would like to welcome you to uh, tonight's program with Sarah Bernard. Uh, before um, I talk a little bit about our series, I'd like to uh, thank our uh, funders, Lorraine and Martin Beitler, who originally gifted Andy Warhol's 10 portraits of Jews of the 20th century to the museum in 20, uh, 2006, and who have already also funded uh, this series of uh, presentations. And uh, as many um, of you who come regularly to the museum may have noticed, uh, we are undergoing an exciting transformation and big evolution, and we're adding lots of layers of new program and new exhibition series to uh, the museum's program. And uh, one of the things that we are also intensifying is our talks and performance program, um, in which we try to add more contemporary perspectives um, on our collection. Um, one example is, um, as we saw maybe outside, how we've started to incorporate um, Judaica works into um, this exhibition repetition and difference that, in which we pair Judaica with contemporary art. Um, this uh, set of works here behind me, the 10 portraits of Jews of the 20th century, was made in 1980 by Andy Warhol and um, was shown here last at the Jewish Museum in 2008. And um, as you can see, it includes uh, portraits of figures uh, such as um, Einstein and Freud and uh, also one of my favorite characters, Groucho Marx. And um, I take that opportunity to uh, let you know that on June 11th, we will actually have Groucho Marx with us. Um, I've heard that Harpo is also planning on uh, showing up and uh, Groucho Marx will be portrayed by the writer and performer Noah Diamond. What I found most interesting about this series of, of works is that um, Andy Warhol actually never met any of those um, uh, figures. Um, and um, I thought I wanted to be a step um, in advance of Andy Warhol and bring all those 10 back to life, back to the Jewish Museum, and um, investigating Jewish history through looking at the lives of uh, these historical figures. And um, I think uh, at the beginning, the, the idea was met with skepticism. Uh, some people said it maybe uh, was a little too, too simple or too absurd or too sensational. And then I was thinking, how could I bring them back? And I think I told this uh, to some of you already that I started looking into crystal balls. And um, I consulted the famous witches from the Black Forest. Uh, and somehow it, all of that didn't really seem to work. So what I finally decided to do was um, much more straightforward. I'm, I'm bringing experts on these um, characters' lives to the Jewish Museum, and um, they are impersonating um, each uh, of them. And um, maybe some of you saw um, our Gertrude Stein evening and uh, the evening with Freud, and we're marching on now tonight with Sarah Bernard and followed by Groucho Marx in the late spring. So tonight, um, as I said, we will meet legendary actress Sarah Bernard, and she will speak through Carol Ogman. And Carol Ogman is a professor of art history at Williams College, where she specializes in French art of the late 18th and 19th century, as well as in contemporary art and culture. And her expertise ranges from uh, the neoclassical painter uh, Anger. Is that right? Did I pronounce it correctly? Ang I yeah, it's like this difficult. Um, to, of course, Sarah Bernard, to the, to the history of the Barbie doll, to performing bodies in real space and in time. Um, in addition to that, her essays uh, cover a wide range of uh, subjects, the nude, portraiture, stereotypes, and um, she has recently published Angrous Eroticized Bodies, Retracing the Ter Serpentine Line, and um, Sarah Bernard, The Art of High Drama, which she co-authored with Kenneth Silver. Uh, with whom she also curated the Sarah Bernard show here at the Jewish Museum in 2005 and 2006, which included over 250 objects. Right now, Ackman is finishing a new body of work entitled Sarah Bernard's Handkerchief, and I think we're going to hear about that handkerchief a little bit uh, more later on, uh, in which she is considering uh, the personal narrative of Bernard in relation to the object's power to enliven and to heal loss. And it is uh, um, ending in a working up to a one woman show uh, in which you will again be Sarah Bernard. Um, so 
With this conversation, I would like to examine Sarah Bernard's life, her ambitions and career, as well as her legacy in relation to our life today. Um, but, this, but this time, in contrast to the exhibition that we had with the person right here, responding not only to my questions, but also to yours. Um, and um, not only questions, perhaps also criticism and concerns. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank Carol for agreeing to be part of this experiment. Um, at this moment, I would also like to take the opportunity to thank two um, people here at the museum, Jenna Weiss, who is the manager of public programs, who uh, has helped me tremendously in making this series possible, and also Daniel Palmer, who is our Leon Levy assistant curator, who worked with me on preparing the series. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that our staff is going to hand out little note cards and pencils, and you can write your questions for Sarah on that, and we will collect them at the end of uh, our conversation, and um, I will then read them to Sarah. So please uh, turn off your cell phones and join me in welcoming Sarah Bernard. Thank you so much for being here. It's a great pleasure to be back in New York. I haven't been here since 1918. <laughs> and it's taken my seances, which I practiced fairly regularly with the playwright Victorian Sardou. We were both spiritists. Um, and I guess they actually finally worked, because me voila. I mean, Sardou might have ended up as a gnat somewhere uh, in, in another country, but I'm here at the Jewish Museum, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you. And let me just uh, jump into the first question, uh, something that's probably on everybody's mind, uh, which is that um, a lot of uh, your background is unknown. Um, we don't know who your parents were. Uh, there's a lot of um, unclear elements, and um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit to that and how that maybe has also helped you to establish that uh, stage persona that you have created over the years. Well, yes. Um, certainly there are a lot of stories that have been told about me. Um, and my uh, life started out um, in some interesting ways. Um, but I think I have to say that um, it was important uh, to me to know that people were telling stories about me. I mean, it was a time when I was born and came of age. It was the dawn of mass culture. I mean, a veritable explosion of newspapers and magazines and photographs and, and the poster came into being and I was around for the very um, early moments of cinema. Um, and so uh, when I was young, um, and actually we might look at this, this beautiful portrait um, by Felix Nader. Now I sat for this when I was somewhere around 20 years of age. And I didn't yet have a career at all. Um, and Nadal went on to become one of the great celebrity photographers. Uh, really, you know, somebody like the 19th century version of Richard Avedon, maybe, right? Or, or Annie Leibovitz. Um, but he, in some ways, I think, already saw something about what I was to become. Um, but in fact, you know, what the media said about me often drew, as you say, on very little information. Um, so I started my career actually um, in the 1860s and early 70s. I'm showing you uh, when I was very, very young here. Um, playing uh, two roles at the Odeon, um, and um, one of them shows me as a young troubadour. It was my first breeches role um, of nine, including Hamlet later on. And on the right is um, the Spanish queen in Victor Hugo's Ruy Blas. Um, so, um, my repertory was pretty romantic, 
early on at the Odeon, although I had started with a classical repertory. Oh my, earpiece problems. Um, at uh, the Comédie Française, the premier classical theater in France and one of the great theaters of Europe. Um, and early in my career, I was not just an actress, uh, I also was a sculptor and a painter, and I continued to do that throughout my life. Um, we will actually have a little example of a work of yours later on in the evening. Yes, I'm excited to, to <laughs> see that. Um, so this is my uh, extremely good friend, and some people say one of my big squeezes during my lifetime, uh, the painter Louise Abema, but this is a sculpture I made. So did you know that I was pretty good? <laughs> really good. And I would use the exquisite. I would use the sale of my sculptures to buy wild animals because I had quite a collection. I had a cheetah, I had a tiger for a while. Um, I used to walk around with some boggle-eyed lizards attached to one of my gowns. Um, so, um, in, in any event, um, I wanted to show you a rather later sculpture, because this was from the 70s. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you go back a moment? This, this thing that, you know, somebody who didn't know me might think was a letter opener. You know, but it's more probably like a dagger, but it's, it's also algae. You know, I did these very organic pieces that, you know, I think now looking back on them were very, very forward looking for the time. Definitely. Yes, yeah, so, um, I mean, if you want to know about my early life a little bit, when I was sculpting and first on the stage, I mean, um, you know... I wanted also to ask you, yeah. not about your early life, but you were so much the embodiment of an idea of the Belle Epoque that I wonder how it must have been for someone of your age at that time to, to live in Paris, which was, you know, the center of, of, of the cultural world. Well, it was grand. I mean, it was grand. It was a time of so much change. Um, you know, uh, I was a teenager when all of Paris was being rebuilt under the Baron Haussmann, under the reign of Napoleon III. Um, uh, it was the advent of the department store. I mean, there was an explosion of theatrical venues, uh, the Café Concert, um, the Cabaret, uh, the Dance Hall. I mean, I was part of that period. And I knew a lot of people, of course, um, which was also um, rather wonderful. I mean, um, many people accused me of um, not being quite respectable, shall we say. Um, I had uh, a lot of supposed lovers, um, including the Belgian prince, Charles de Ligne, with whom I had my son. Um, that is documented, you know, but some of the others, well, <laughs> you know, I'm a fairly private person, actually. So if you were to read my um, autobiography, of which there's one extant volume, it's been translated into English, I want to say it's rather amazing that coming back now, I'm speaking English. <laughs> because I never did. You know, I only performed in French. And people would say, because I was such a physical actress, and so I suppose I have to say very gestural, yes. Um, Mark Twain went to see me, for example. He came out of the theater and he said, I understood everything she said until I left the theater and realized I don't speak a word of French. <laughs> You know, so my acting style really, really was useful for that. So I was rumored to have had a liaison with the Prince of Wales, um, with Charles Haas, who was the inspiration for Swan in Proust. 
um, with a few counts, um, uh, with my teachers, you know, uh, the artist Gustave Doré, Alfred Stevens, Abema. Um, there were quite a few that I was supposed to have been involved with. And I had also um, many wonderful friends. I mean, uh, the composer Ronaldo Ahn, who wrote these great art songs, and Robert de Montesquieu, the, the dandy. We were very close. Edmond Rostand, um, I starred in many of his plays, including um, Cyrano. I played Cyrano and also Roxane. Mm -hmm. not, not in the same performance. Not in the same performance. Mm -hmm. Um, and then a lot of fabulous people came to see me. You know, so Freud, who came to the museum, he came and he had my photograph outside his office. He was quite smitten by me. Um, Colette came and she wrote about seeing me. Um, Mark Twain, as I mentioned, Alice B. Toklas came to see me. Um, D.H. Lawrence. It was quite a crowd, you know. Um, and then, you know, my origins, to get back to your question. Yeah, I wanted to get, get to that specifically in the context of the Jewish museum. Yes. To talk a little bit about your Jewish, Jewish identity. Yes. Um, and, um, I thought you might. <laughs> yes. I found so, out that you were actually baptized. Yes, I was. Yes, to my surprise. At quite an early age. And I was sent to a Catholic school. And you know, it's actually very interesting um, that I was a practicing Catholic my whole life. But because my mother was a Jew, of course, I was perceived to be a Jew in the 19th century in France, yes. And that was not really a badge of honor in some ways for most of French society. So these are just a few of the caricatures. I was mercilessly caricatured from the 1870s into the 1880s. And they're interesting because they um, clearly on the one hand um, speak to things that were considered to be recognizably Jewish about me. So that would be my profile, that would be my unruly hair, which was compared at the time to the hair of a blonde negress. That was the phrase. This was not a compliment, right? Um, and you can see that that was also tied to the notion of money, that I was considered to be avid for, um, for money. And so here I am, um, the tart that laid the golden eggs. And uh, la poule is the tart, which means the whore. And I'm kind of wearing these little garters that would suggest that. And I'm under the watchful eye of the man who wrote most of the plays that I performed in in the 1880s. Um, and this would be Victorian Sardou, who wrote uh, Theodora for me. He wrote Cleopatra for me. He wrote many, many plays in which I starred. Um, and here, you see me actually wearing my studio suit, which I might say was a white satin pantsuit designed by Charles Frederick Worth. And um, you can see that despite the fact that I was always ultra feminine in my dress, and I would like to think in my comportment, um, I am shown splay-legged here. I was always shown to be masculine because I did not conform to the expectations for a proper woman in the 19th century. First of all, I went on the stage. <laughs> and then I did these other things. I sculpted and I painted. And, and you can see that some of the attributes of my multiple professions are here. 
And um, a scholar actually did some research on this star because you're all thinking, oh, she's inscribed in a Jewish star. But actually, when this would have been made in the 1880s, it didn't have that fixed meaning yet. That didn't come until Zionism in the 30s. So this is actually just a star, like a star, like a celebrity star. But my Jewishness was hugely um, caricatured, mercilessly so. So you just mentioned the star, being yes. a star. Yes, yes I did. And in some way, um, I was thinking when I was looking at the Warhol portraits, what made Warhol choose uh, these particular ten figures? Mm. And when I came to you, I thought, well, he was always interested in the superstar, in the celebrity, and in, in some way you have been the ultimate prototype of a celebrity, the first celebrity, or a celebrity before we even thought about celebrity. Well, thank you for recognizing that, because I, I am the model of celebrity. I mean, really, I am the template for celebrity. There's absolutely no question. And that manifested itself in lots of different ways. Um, just to deal with the images on the screen, this is a nine-foot-tall oil portrait of me by the artist Georges Clarent, with whom I'm also ru rumored to have had an affair. Um, he was my painting teacher. And he painted this portrait. Um, so I was very distinctive. Not only was I the Jewess and uh, the daughter of a courtesan and the niece of a courtesan, um, I was also known to have been the skinniest woman in France. And that was not a compliment. This was not an age of heroin chic, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, <laughs> what I did was I decided I'm going to play that up. I'm not going to wear a corset, which every respectable woman did. So I had my clothing basically sewed onto my body. You know, and I took the form of a spiral. When I sat, I sat in a spiral. And uh, that's what my friend Rinaldo Ann called it. Um, and I liked um, a lot of excrescences. You know, I like to have a train. Ah, you want to get me to film? Yeah, of course you would. So I started making films in 1900. You remember the Lumiere brothers? Like, that's about when cinema started. And I was really the first person who had a big celebrity name to do film. You know why? Because film in the early 20th century was considered trash. Popular entertainment, not art at all. But what, I did it. What interested you so early on in the medium of film? Well, um, I liked the new. I liked the new. Um, maybe I was getting older. I didn't get quite the same gigs that I might have once had. So when people said, do you want to do film? Do you want to do vaudeville? Do you want to do musical? I said, yes. But there's another reason. So, I then, was interested in art as something that was brought to a large public. You know what I mean? I wanted a big audience, always. Film got me that audience. This is, I'm about to die as Queen Elizabeth in a film of 1912. It was shown here in New York. It was produced by Adolf Zukor. It was so successful that it enabled Zukor to found Paramount Studios with that money. And this is a great death scene because I'm about to fall face forward dead <laughs> on those pillows, right? Yes. So the thing is that everybody who became interested in film in Hollywood saw my work, knew me, knew that I had a 60-year career on stage and then on screen on top of that. And Hollywood was obsessed with me. 
Do you know how many people, stars in Hollywood films, compared themselves to me? Let's start with, let's see, Judy Garland, John Barrymore, Jane Powell, um, Marilyn Monroe, more in a minute, um, Catherine Hepburn. You watch their films, I can give you the references. Um, Nicole Kidman in Moulin Rouge, Annette Benning. It just goes on and on. But might we show the clip, which is one of my favorite. I had onions at lunch. I had garlic dressing at dinner. But he'll never know, because I stay kissing sweet the new Dazzle Dent way. You do that beautifully. Thank you. You know, people don't realize that every time I show my teeth on television, I'm appearing before more people than Sarah Bernhardt appeared before in her whole career. It's something to think about. Oh, it certainly is. I wish I were old enough to have seen Sarah Bernhardt. Was she magnificent? <laughs> One other yeah. question that I had for you. <clears throat> What would have happened to you if you would have been born 50 years prior or 100 years later? Mm. Well, I might have been that woman there who uh, is known simply as Rachel. She was the greatest tragedian of her time and performed probably up to 1850, all at the Comédie Française. She was the daughter of a Jewish peddler you know, so there was some precedent um, for Jews in the theater. We didn't have to wait till Hollywood. It was already all there. Um, she was known to be very contained and cerebral as an actor. And you can see that. She was likened to a column. There I am in Phaedra. And I, of course, am Columna, but soft supple, feminine, fainting. You know, really the opposite of Rachel. All sort of feminine grace and feeling and swooning. You know, my friend Cocteau said that the arms of Sarah Bernhardt could, through their swooning, contain the world. <laughs> Lovely, no? Oh, yes, well. A hundred years later. Yes, so, you know, I appeared in lingerie. <laughs> in 1881. In 1881, when I played in La Dame aux Camélias, which you call Camille. You know that play, and then Greta Garbo, and yes. Well, I did that on the stage. It was probably my most famous role. I performed it only 3,500 times on stage. And then I did it in the cinema. But, you know, I did everything Madonna did, only better. <laughs> really, really. Was there anything that ever held you back? Nothing ever held me back, no. You know, because... They could fling it, and I could fling it back. And I had this motto, which was very useful to me, quand même. It means against all odds, in spite of everything, no matter what. And you try being the daughter and niece of a courtesan, a Jew, not a proper woman, a woman on the stage with multiple careers, multiple liaisons, who has to have her leg amputated at the hip in which, 1915. Which back. I, I love that I've come back with my leg <laughs> and that I'm not the age I was when I died because I lived to be 79, you know. So, yes. 
We talked a lot about death already. And there was oh. one very, very famous saying by you that you do death for a living. I, I died every day, you know, and twice a day when there was a matinee. <laughs> and, and the thing that is really fascinating about me and dying um, is that I was so good at it on stage that by the 1870s, everybody said, you have to die. Like picture going to see Madonna and everybody says, well, you have to sing like a virgin. Well, I had to die, right? And so think about that. What it means on an emotive level to die every night, to feel that on some level. Um, so I had a very intimate relationship with death, which I believe kept me performing and living for a very, very long time. Right. So, oh, I just, can we go back one second? I'm very voluble. This photograph I had taken of me in a coffin I'm not dead. What do you think? Of course not. I was 35 when I had this taken. This was a publicity image that circulated as a postcard during my lifetime. And you'll notice my friend Abima is looking over at my coffin. I quite love it, yes. Um, I also was very involved with the macabre. I mean, it's no surprise I'm wearing black. I'm in New York, but, you know. Um, I, I had a bat hat, for example, <laughs> with a real taxidermied bat. And this is one of my sculptures. It's a self-portrait of me as a sphinx, you know, with bat wings. It's actually an inkwell. You see that little recipient in the front? But I have these kind of sphinx claws, and I made it around the time I was playing the sphinx in 1881. You know, and there's the, the pen, the plumed pen, you know, in, in the back of my head. So, yes. <coughs> um, we have another clip here. Oh, yes. Well, I just wanted to, um, oh, this to show you me dying as Camille on stage. This is 1881, when I first premiered the role. Um, and here's the film. So, yes. <laughs> I've never seen anyone die more gracefully. Why, thank you. But that was only one performance, you know. So, I saw that you dropped the handkerchief while you were dying. I, I did, you know, and I was extremely good at palming it because you didn't know I had it until the moment when it had to come out. And um, Sarah Bernhardt, here's the thing. Film was my passport to immortality. Theater is different, of course. You know, people remember it, and of course, dying 3,500 times as Camille, maybe people would say something about it. But one of the things that I love is this story about my handkerchief. So I had this handkerchief that I gave to a great actress in about 1910. It was Julia Marlowe, who was a Shakespearean actress, and she and I crossed at BAM. Did you know I performed at BAM? Yeah, in the teens. 
on, on one of my farewell tours, uh, there were nine tours and four farewell tours <laughs> in America. And so I gave this handkerchief in about 1910 to Julia Marlowe, and he, I, I came to learn that it, it was, it's still in circulation. And so when there was a big show devoted to me, um, it was in the show, and Cherry Jones, whom you see on the right, actually was in possession of the handkerchief, and so she loaned it to the show, and Anne Bogart, director of City Company, came with Cherry Jones and some other wonderful performers. So Cherry on the right, Deborah Winger, and this woman I don't know very well, some curator named Carol Ackman, um, and uh, Lynn Cohen, who's sitting very close by, I'm happy to say, Ellen Lauren, and the soprano Lauren Flanagan, who sang arias from operas that are based on plays written for me. Do you know that Tosca was a play that I premiered? Hmm. I didn't know that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yes, it was, it was great, that murder. I liked it a lot. Yeah. So, yes. Yes, we spoke about this already. Uh, you and an, uh, as an artist, and um, we have a wonderful piece in our collection, which I'm very proud to uh, bring out. We could put the lights up a little bit here on stage. This is uh, Daniel Palmer, our assistant curator, assisting us here. Thank you. So now we have to, yeah, the light is coming on a little bit. So I hope you can all see this. So this is a self-portrait. I haven't seen this in a very long time. <laughs> You know, this is quite an early piece for me. This was kind of one of the greatest years of my life, 1876. Um, and uh, you can see that it's a self-portrait of me in a play, La Fille de Roland. Um, and that if you are looking from an angle, you might see that profile. Now people caricatured me to death, but my profile also was considered to be that of a beautiful Jewess. You know, there could be something pretty and sexy, as you know, about Jewesses, right? And, and I think I captured that here in this portrait of me. And you know I was only 30-something, so, so I look quite good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I think the portrait of Abema, which is, you know, around the same time, well, of course it's marble, I think it's, it's better. Yeah, but it's a great piece to have here and to see me in costume and a self-portrait one of not many I did. So thank, thank, you, you, thank so you so much. much. So we're and talking about profile and face. Yeah. And of course your face um, was mm. all over during that period. Um, tell yeah. us a little bit about that moment, Art yes. Nouveau, and your relationship to the artists of that time. Yes, well, Alphonse Mucha, you know. Um, I knew him quite well. In fact, I made his career because I commissioned him in 1895 to do these life-size posters of me, and he did nine of them, nine of me en rôle. You know, so here you have um, three examples, and what is interesting about this um, is that he was my Warhol, you know, Jens? He was really my Warhol because he understood repetition and variation. He understood the multiple, right? I'm always in profile. The format is always the same. I'm always in a niche, right? 
Um, I'm in costumes, that varies obviously accordingly. Um, and then he made these very flat and patterned in that Art Nouveau style. Uh, sort of like, you know, the signs for the metro, uh, which mm -hmm. is roughly contemporary with these images. And Alphonse actually also designed for me. He designed menus and jewelry. Um, he designed my famous snake bracelet, um, which was studded with opals and rubies and solid gold, I might add. And it was execute, but executed by the great jeweler Georges Fouquet in Paris at that time. And of course, I patronized René Lalique. I mean, who wouldn't? Um, and he made some of my personal jewelry, but also this crown of lilies that I wore in this play by Rostand, um, which would be translated The Faraway Princess. So I had a lot of Art Nouveau things that I wore both on stage and used as publicity and then also wore out and about in town, yes. Um, it was integral, really, to my vision. Yeah, um, one of the things that really come up is that um, you really have a very particular sense of, of you, yourself in terms of how to present yourself to the public, almost to the degree of branding. And mm. I was sort of seeing similarities to uh, perhaps Elena Rubinstein, who has an exhibition uh, downstairs, very early on thinking about creating this particular character. What wonderful woman, yes. And uh, in many ways, we are quite similar. Uh, Eclectic, eccentric, yes, very interested in fashion in a very particular way that became associated with us. Um, branding, it's an interesting word because, of course, people wanted to use my name and my image um, for all sorts of products. So here I am. Lefebvre Utile is still in business, still makes cookies in France. <laughs> and here I am as uh, the bloodthirsty empress of Byzantium, Theodora, about to strike advertising cookies, biscuits, yes? <laughs> and the mask of tragedy, of course, below. Um, but also, I worked with some of the most pioneering poster artists, not only Mucha, but this is Chéret, who preceded Mucha, was one of the first people to make large format color posters in the 1880s. And here I am doing one of my many ads for makeup. This is uh, face powder, the diaphanous Sarah Bernhardt. And, of course, I was diaphanous, you know, ethereal. Um, and I was very interested in new media, as well as old media. Um, I went to have my voice recorded in Edison, New Jersey, by Tama Alva, Alva Edison in 1881. That's really, really early. And so my voice survives on recordings. You have to go to good archival collections for that, but you can hear me. And um, I like to have a lot of, you know, souvenirs. Souvenirs. And so you could buy this little bronze figurine of me as the little eaglet which was my most famous britches role that I did in 1900. I was the last surviving heir of Napoleon. And it, it doesn't end well, you know. I have to kind of expiate, you know, his excesses on the battlefield. Um, and uh, so you could buy one of these little bronze sculptures, or you could have a little souvenir button with my profile. And by the way, I was wearing a kind of spandex uniform designed by Paul Poiré, which still exists in shreds. The suit can't be reconstituted, but there are pieces of it around. 
So, um, yes, I think branding would be applicable to me. I was a major publicist. Yeah, and yeah. appearing in publicity and advertisement. So here, um, it, it sounds like really like a rags to riches story, becoming the queen of, of the stage, coming from an obscure background. Yes, I, I think you could say that. Um, I mean, I'm not just a queen. Here I'm an empress, I think, you know. <laughs> Theodora, this gives you some sense of my physical style, why you, why you could understand me, even though I didn't perform in English or any other language but French. You could understand because it was so physical. But I was also iconic, you know, you can see me all bejeweled here and kind of frozen, uh, like a statue. Both of these are Theodora. I loved Byzantium. It was a big craze in the late 19th century. Think of Gustave Moreau, the artist. Um, and look yes. at these incredible costumes. Uh, wonderful costumes, yes, wonderful costumes. And I have some more here, and I was interested in that relationship between costumes and clothing. And yes. Um, how did that... Um, well, I should say, first of all, mm. that, you know, my background wasn't all that obscure. And my mother and aunt knew a lot of very aristocratic gentlemen. Let's just say this. And I traveled in those circles. And in fact, I had my only child, Maurice. And the father was a Belgian prince, Charles de Ligne. That didn't end very well, but you know, my, my son I was very close to all my life. Um, somebody helped me audition for the Comédie Française, who was a member of my mother's circle. Um, so I had some advantages, let's just say that. But I think you can see um, that I liked these big colors, and I liked boas, and I liked trains, and I liked the spiral. Um, this is a British artist named Dudley Hardy um, on the right. Yes, and you can see my hair. You know, I sometimes had to put it up in a knot. I just couldn't do anything with it. Yeah. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Here's some more examples oh. of the costumes. You know, there were 40,000 gems in my robe for the Empress of Byzantium here on the right. And we brought this. We brought this. I didn't bring it. You brought it. The Jewish Museum brought it. And this double-headed crown. Isn't this great? It had real opals and turquoise in it. Um, you know, there's a, a sort of relation between my theater costumes, the aesthetic of them, and my uh, private wardrobe, but they were very distinct. I mean, I, I wouldn't go out on the street wearing that robe. I did go out on the street wearing this little chinchilla capelet. Um, that, that was a favorite item of mine. Um, yes, so... Um, I wanted to come back oh. to Andy Warhol and your relationship to him. What do you make of him? Well, I would have loved to have met him. I mean, just clearly we were uh, sort of separated at birth, but we never, you know, met. Um, <laughs> and we were all, both of us, so about the image. I mean, it was completely about the image. And so, you know, he, he made these multiples of himself. Um, I have some I, more here. Yes. You saw Marilyn before. Yes, Marilyn, it's not surprising he would go for Marilyn, he, he, that he went for me. Of course he would go for me. Um, you know, whether he knew Mucha or not, he would go for me for that kind of uh, sexy, um, starlet thing that, that I have. And, um, and he understood something that I understood way before him, of course, which is repetition and variation. That's how you get a public. You have to repeat because otherwise they won't know you, right? You have to have something that they can recognize. But you can change it, and you must change it. So you know, some of my detractors would compare me 
to like Ford's assembly line. Because, you know, they said every year I would do the same thing. I would just put a different um, headlight on it or a different color or, you know, different upholstery. Well, okay, but what is wrong with that? You know, because I was giving people something they really wanted. And so was Andy, I think. You know, people wanted this. And by the way, there's something so macabre about these images. Um, the being off register and the shadows. Marilyn and Liz look like skulls. And he, he and I would have loved to talk about that, the image is death. Have you ever seen the black and white Marilyns by Wall? Yes, I have. Um, but, you know, and he, he knew about publicity and he knew about branding and he could make, you know, a thousand soup cans. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because he didn't make my portrait out of whole cloth. He took a photograph, of course, and he took a photograph of me as Camille. And I love that he took that role, because that was my most famous role, and in many ways, my signature. And so he immortalized me for yet another, you know, 100 or more years um, in this series. And now you're back, and I'm wondering, oh, yes. what do you make of all these ladies? Uh, well, you know, I, I'm very interested in the kind of ways in which there's so many different kinds of theatrical venues, much as in my own time. And that actors, you know, I think of uh, people like Lynn Cohen or Sherry Jones or Diane Wiest. Um, you know, they're all wonderful um, classical actors in their training and they can do Shakespeare and they do but they also do movies and they do TV and some of the most famous celebrities whom you recognize today um, do that kind of crossover thing but you know, just to go back one minute to the other slide, it's like, they're not so sexy. So I mean, the they're sexy wonderful ones, yeah. actors. But, um, you know, I You compare need, yourself with these ladies Well, more. yeah, I need to have that classical thing, but also uh, to be the very feminine, sensual, seductive actress and to play with fashion, you know. Um, that's not something Maggie Smith is known for, Judy Dench, for example. Um, but yes, you know. Um, so there's a way in which I move between um, actors and pop stars. And I was a pop star myself, right? So. Um, you know, I was better than Lady Gaga <laughs> myself, and actually people have said so. Uh, there's a website of Caleb Wilde, who's a sixth generation funeral director, and he shows on the website me in my coffin, and he says, Lady Gaga has nothing on Sarah Bernhardt. Well, you know, he's right. Now, Beyonce, too, I mean, she's fabulous, and I'm not a singer, you know. But I was famous for my golden voice. That's what Victor Hugo called it. Oh, by the way, I was said to have had a liaison with Victor Hugo. <laughs> And some of my co-stars, you know, it's predictable, yes. Um, so, you know, I think that Scarlett Johansson is kind of interesting in this regard because she can play a lot of different roles and she's made herself a household seductress, which is kind of amazing because one wouldn't have thought that of her. 
But I did something very similar, you know, the scrawny little Jewess I made myself into, you know. I'm incredibly impressed how uh, you kept up to date with the uh, development of popular culture Thank you. from the beyond. Well, I would love to stay alive for a long time now. You know. If you, if you don't mind, I would like to uh, maybe start to take some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I think uh, the audience is very eager to participate in our conversation. And, um, Thank I you for coming. So I think we're getting some questions mm. here. You can ask me very private things. Because this is my second incarnation of which I'm aware. So that is kind of dead. Oh, this, is kind of, this is very related to our conversation just now about mm. these uh, pop stars. Who would you actually like to meet the most? Madonna, Barbara Streisand, Lady Gaga, or someone else? And why? Mm. Well... That's a hard question. Um, because in a way I wouldn't mind meeting a kind of more serious actor too, you know? Hmm. Maybe Vanessa Redgrave we'd have something to talk about. Or, um, hmm, I'd be happy to meet all of the, and of course I'll meet all of these people. It's just kind of obvious, right? Because I, I'll go see them, and they'll come see me in whatever I'm doing. So, you know, uh, that's the great thing, is I don't probably have to do much for them to come out. Well, uh, I mean, just when they hear Sarah Bernhardt's alive, I mean, you came. Yeah. So what is life like for you these days in heaven? Um, do you still perform? Oh, of course. I couldn't go a day without performing. You know? I, I, I have scaled back a little bit. Well, I had, you know, because when I had my leg amputated, I couldn't do full-length plays anymore. So um, I did one act. And, and, and I, I would have myself placed on the stage. And then it was kind of great because I would have props so that when I wanted to get up, I would stand on my one leg, you know, and, and people had no idea. They forgot all about the fact that I only had one leg. That's what the theater can do, right? So, um, I think, you know, I died for a living, and when I died, I had to live. So, that's really what happened. <laughs> Let's see what else we have. Heaven here. is fun. There's a great group up there, you know? <laughs> so this is like relates to the same. What does a, a typical day and night look like for you these days? Well, I'm waiting to see what that will be now, you know. I think that there are a lot of uh, venues I need to explore. You know, even in my own time. You know, there was a Sarah Bernhardt impersonator in 1881. And I was playing in Philadelphia, and I was doing a serious play, of course. And I went to see um, this impersonator, female impersonator, uh, who was absolutely wonderful. And there, I have been a great target for um, impersonators. Um, and, and also for stand-up. I mean, so I live on in a lot of different modes of entertainment, opera as well, of course. So I, I have a lot of clubbing to do. I have a lot of theater to see. And, um, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll be performing again in museums. In the, in the 21st century, you obviously would also be a global superstar, not only I was in France. a global superstar. I have a question here from... I uh, performed in Samoa in my last life. A Chinese uh, audience Russia. member. Um, a Chinese uh, um, audience member asked me the question, oh. or asked you the question, um, what role in Chinese history you would have uh, liked to play on stage? 
Oh, my. Um, that's a big one. I haven't thought about that because I never toured Asia. So I think that that is for my future. Um, is there one you would like me to do? Where is my questioner? Anybody come to mind? A Chinese uh, Of course, I would play all the empresses. Yes. Mao's daughter. What actual, what actual training did you have for acting? Oh, well, you know, I auditioned um, when I was under 20 for the Comédie Française. And uh, so I was admitted. So I had the most amazing classical training that there is um, anywhere. Uh, but then, you know, I wanted a different kind of audience at a certain moment. And you know, that happened after I first toured the US. Um, I, I, did, uh, I began to do melodrama. So I did things like Camille, and then I had Sardou write all these melodramas for me. You know, some people have said that I, my career is an example of downward mobility. Mm -hmm. And I kind of love that. You know, but maybe to get to a really democratic theater, you need downward mobility. You can't, you know, be up there doing Phaedra every minute at the Comédie Française but you could do Phaedra in the open air somewhere outside on a, a pier in New York, for example, you know? Um, so I, I'm, I'm interested in that uh, aspect of performing. Well, there's another way of performing, which is if you go into politics, and there's a mm. question related to that. What is your relationship to politics? And what is your opinion on two female politicians in particular? Um, I'm sure you're familiar with Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin. <laughs> well, I'd really like to meet Hillary Clinton, actually. Um, yes, I think she'd be, she's a very smart woman. Um, uh, she, she knows that you don't know about Russia because you are from Alaska. <laughs> Um, so, so I, I think, yes, um, you know, we both wore pants, Hillary and I. Uh, I had, you know, I had worth, and she really needs to come up a notch still, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I think we, she knows the problems of dressing for success. I mean, both politicians know that, just in the same way that actors know that, or they should, or otherwise they're men and they don't think about it very much. Yeah. Good, yeah. I wonder if there's any other question or if there's anything that you uh, urgently have to um, tell us. Otherwise... Um, I'd, I'd love to take questions. One more question over there. We have to bring this to an end. So, uh, yeah. Well, this is a great question. Um, you know, that question of identification is complicated. Um, because I was identified as a Jew, I could not avoid being identified as a Jew. If you were a Jew in 19th century France, um, you could not escape that, nor could you in the early 20th century, as we know. Um, and, uh, but, um, I think, in a way, one moment that really was important for me was uh, the Dreyfus affair. Um, because poor Captain Dreyfus, you know, he was framed, he didn't do anything, and so I publicly came out in his defense. And you know, all of France was split on this. There are wonderful people, wonderful artists like Degas, who was on the other side, Renoir, Degas were on the other side. But then there were people who were pro-Dreyfus, and I was one of those. And I wrote notes supporting him, and it said that I actually, the morning that um, 
Zola's J'accuse was published in the newspaper, which was a big defense of Dreyfus at the time. I actually wanted to support him, and so I came to his balcony and threw open the windows. This is said. It's said that I did this. Um, but, um, but I think that in many ways, in my own mind, I was, of course, a Catholic. Um, and so the tension was always there because I was inevitably a Jewess. And I accepted the things that I was called. I had to. I would not have survived had I not been able to do that. And comment in spite of everything. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and she would have done like this.